Okay, so uh, we are going to um, tell you about synastry and how synastry works. Uh, my name is Ajani. This is my girlfriend, Shanna. You cannot see this, but we've got a couple of dogs down here. Rachel and Chico, you may actually see them pop up on the screen at some point. And then the other one. They're not camera shy. No, they're not. And, and, and they're a little bit shameless. Yeah, in fact, uh, I think you can see a paw from Rachel. She's, she's really generally, comfortable here. Generally. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, Synastry is basically the astrology of uh, combining events. And there are a couple of ways that you can look at synastry. In my book, Hayden's Book of Synastry, I have synastric charts, which is one chart laid over another. And then I also have composite charts, which is more of a kind of a psychological uh, spin on things. Later in my book, Alma Mater, I tell you about relative charts. And for practical purposes, if you really want to look at how a relationship runs, it's life and death, the things that, that, that um, cause it to be at its best, and you probably want to look at relative charts. The overlay charts where you've got one wheel outside of another wheel are more about you and the other person interacting. But the synastry charts, sorry, the relative charts, the one where we merge for a time and place are you as a couple, you as a unit. And the point of this recording is to tell you basically how to set up your uh, exchange with another chart for success. And so if uh, we have any questions going on, then... I, I, I already have questions oh, going okay. on. Mm -hmm. Okay, like how are you determining what elements of each of those charts are going into kind of that combined relative chart? So... Basically, in astrology, you have major planets, things like the sun and the moon and Mars, and those are defaults. Uh, but that's a good question because there are some asteroids that are really strong indicators of um, chart success. And you can actually see some of them on the one that I pulled up here. Um, the ones that I want to kind of look at are Bacchus up here. There's one called the Uruguay. Hera and Juno. Those are really the strong relationship charts. Now, Uruguay is new. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know the number. Mm -hmm. So um, those of you who are watching this video will need to kind of look up what the asteroid numbers are. I know Bacchus is 2063. And Juno and Hera can actually be kind of, um, oh, one of them is 2060 or 2065. Well, whatever. Anyway, the point is you can look up the number and I'll probably put it in the notes or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. okay, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Is the number like in any way tied to like numerology, or, or is it no. just a reference point? It's just a reference point. Okay. So those are called uh, MPC numbers, the minor planet center numbers. And uh, typically, when you are putting a chart together, you'll have the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, all those guys, and mm -hmm. if you want extra asteroids in there, there'll be a box that says list the MPC numbers of the extra asteroids you want to see. Okay. So uh, if you have those numbers, and you can put them in there, and they will pop up in your chart. Now, in my book, Alma Mater, I tell you how to read these. This is Full, Spe Spo Full Spectrum Astrology 5, Alma Mater. It's a gray book. It's got like a sun on it. Um, and there is a chapter near the end which tells you how to read these charts. In those charts, I start by saying, if you want to just know how a relationship is going to go, then you look at what are called the axes. There are six of these uh, points. The ascendant, the descendant, which is opposite, the ascendant, the vertex, the part of fortune, the imum coli, and the MC, the midheaven. Basically what the aspects are, sorry, the axes are, are your way of accessing the public. So, for example, when your relationship is viewed by people just in the general world, folks are going to see your midheaven. And so our midheaven is in Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is basically in the context of culture. We're here at Sagittarius 1. So it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through Sagittarius 12, the way I kind of break mm -hmm. these up. So Sagittarius 1 is basically Sagittarius stuff, Aries. In the context of culture, uh, our relationship would be seen as basically doing what we feel like. 
they like doing. So yeah. pretty accurate. Pretty accurate, exactly. Okay. Uh, we decided just this afternoon that we were going to record randomly. We definitely did not plan this. We did not plan during, this at all. <laughs> during the day. So Somewhere just, around uh, 10 minutes before we started, yeah, it was suggested. Exactly, exactly. So, um, But your Midheaven is going to tell you basically what you're, you're seen as in the public. Now, when you're not being seen in the public, then opposite the Midheaven is the Imam Koa. This is basically your household the way your house normally runs. Ours is in Gemini 1. So basically, we talk by offering our opinion just based on what is, you know. Pretty much everything. Yeah, pretty much. Under everything. That, yeah, that is, exactly. Yeah. So, there is an opinion about everything. Yeah, here. yeah. So so we, uh, we are quite different in our views. Uh, Shanna's like, she's going to fight that good fight. I try. I try to stay back a little bit, be be more uh, more uh, you know so, uh, about things. Um, but uh, speaking of that, if you look at our chart, you can see how we have Saturn, the planet of limits and boundaries, on our descendant. Now, in a relative chart, your ascendant and your descendant are how you approach the world or how you respond to the world. So it's different from the Midheaven and the Imamkola. Midheaven is how you're seen. Imamkola is what you're doing behind the scenes when nobody's looking at you. Ascendant is basically how you go forth. So if we were to go out in public um, and just kind of choose a, uh, I don't know, choose a spot, choose a venue or something like that, the way we would appear to people is through our ascendant. Ours is in Pisces 1, so we would basically have a kind of space spacey, ambient, mood-based thing to, to how we approach the public. But I call your attention to the descendant. We have vertex, which is one of the six points that you look at in a synastry chart. Uh, and that basically brings about life change. So essentially, whenever we are greeted with something from the outside, it could be news, it could be, uh, I don't know, goings on in the community or something like that, it tends to be more of a big deal, like a major deal, right? Yeah. So um, there with Saturn, it also tends to be a little bit more serious. And so we, we're uh, a bit of an activist pair in different ways. Um, and you can see that in the way that our chart is designed. You look at the four axes, the ascendant and the descendant, um, to look at how your couple goes forward and handles incoming information, and you look at the midheaven and the Imuncoli to just see how you're seen. the vertex is basically why you came together. So, so for example, our vertex is in Virgo 1. We have Virgo 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Virgo 1 is to get a certain kind of work started. Now, it's not actually your conscious reason. But the thing is, when you're looking at a synastry chart, essentially, you've got, um, y y if people said, why does this relationship even exist? Like, what's the point? What, mm -hmm. what do the actors get out of it? Then your vertex is going to give you a certain kind of clue. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm also are... finding it interesting that so many of these are starting at the one. Yes. Okay, is that a typical or common thing? Because it, it seems like there would be a little bit more mix-up, you yeah, know? Well, I know, I know. And and the answer is not really. So it's one out of 12, but because yeah. ours are kind of perfectly square there, uh, it adds an element of prerogative to our relationship. The ones are Aries, the mm -hmm. first sign. And so because we have so many of the major axes starting in the first of the 12 sections of each yeah. sign, it means that doing what we want is really going to be a key part of our exchange. Whereas if somebody had a lot of things in the twos right here, that's between, um, it's not 2.5 degrees, it's 27.5 degrees to 25 degrees of the sun. If they had a lot of things there, it would be more about identity, the money they made, the possessions that they have, those kinds of things. Okay. So, so basically, you go one through twelve, and you look at 
any of the 12 signs. If you have a lot of them in the one degree, it's going to add an Aries element mm -hmm. to the, uh, and then Taurus and the Gemini. So, right. Interesting. Yeah. Curious that there's that many in Aries. Yeah, and we're uh, a couple of stubborn folks as well. That is, that is true. That I is, have said about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, and I think this one here, she's uh, she can be stubborn as well. Oh yeah, yeah. This mm. one, this one is fierce. Yeah, yeah. But right now she is fiercely asleep. Exactly. And uh, but fiercely asleep. <laughs> exactly. So uh, the last of the six points that I talk about in Alma Mater is the part of fortune. This one is is not as heavy as uh, the other axes that we look at, but the part of fortune is essentially your relationships in its element. And so it's the kind of background environment that your relationship prefers. If you're trying to build a kind of a relative chart exchange with somebody or a certain event, and you're like, what surroundings are more conducive for us to prosper then you can look at your part of fortune. Ours are in one, two, three, four, five, six. Gemini six. And Gemini six means that we're taking opinion energy, the Gemini, mm -hmm. and we're turning it into the six energy, which is Virgo, the sixth sign. So we're solving problems, um, very analytical. So if you put us in an analytical space, then um, it's it's more of a beneficial chemical bath for you know your your chemical reaction to take place. So, uh, yeah. Now, before I move on to some of the things, like some of the asteroids um, in kind of our evil plans for, <laughs> for, for making a prosperous relationship, did you have any questions? Not another one yet. No. I, I, I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll keep coming. Okay. That's... All right. Cool, cool, cool. So I'm still a little bit thrown by that whole, this is an Aries, and this is an Aries, and oh, yes. yeah, that's, I wasn't really expecting that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, they're in the different signs, but in yeah. the two decanates, yeah. the sub-sign is the one that you're pulling the energy towards. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, so let's take a look at these four, uh, I want to call them romance asteroids, but we'll call them connectedness asteroids because you can have them, like I said, with your business or something like that. The asteroid Hera is the body that corresponds to deep bonds. It is really, really beneficial if you have Hera on one of the axes. So Hera on the ascendant means that when you go out together in public, you tend to have you, you tend to appear as if you have deep bonds, like you, you're going together, you're, you know, you're like this. Um, positively, you actually are tied. Negatively, you can't get away from each other. So, uh, yeah, our Hera is about 10 degrees off of the ascendant. That's kind of wide, but this doesn't mean anything like negative or positive by itself uh, when your hair is not on an axis because there are other bodies that it's going to connect to at different kinds of angles. Uh, but still, it's in the same sign. It's not that bad. Now, aside from deep bonds, you have Juno. Now, Juno is, is folklorically the asteroid of marriage and commitment. Uh, it's actually the asteroid of public commitment. And I have seen this in so many charts. When you have Juno on an axis, like right here, ours is in, again, one. There it is, Cancer yeah. one. So uh, ours is however the person feels, expressing right there, and that is part of the basis of our commitment. It is not on an axis. Like it's not on the ascendant, and it's not on the midheaven, but it is sharply trying, what you see here, 120 degrees away from the ascendant. And that's positive. So this is one of those relationships where at first glance, you wouldn't know if it worked or not, if you were looking for the good asteroid to be on the axis. Okay, so question, what does that mean by it being in that position away from the ascendant is good? What? Interesting, interesting, and, and this is important what you ask, because basically, when you have something like Juno on the ascendant, that means we're going together in public like we are married. Um, now, interestingly, in this house, we go out 
kind of in alternate sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. walking the dog, maybe you're out there, I'm in here. And so for, for people who are just kind of passing by, it's like, what, who, what, you know? So they, yeah. they can't always it's tell. It's probably a little confusing for um, them. Yeah, probably. They probably shouldn't have their minds on other people's business. <laughs> that exactly, exactly. But if they looked at us from a distance, we wouldn't necessarily look like, oh, we're arm in arm, right? Yeah. When you have Juno on the Ascendant, you look like you're arm in arm. Oh. I've seen this, uh, like I said, in all kinds of charts. So a little bit clingy. A, a little bit clingy. It, it could be. It could be, yes. It might, okay. Yes. And and actually, the reason I said it could be is because I thought once upon a time that having Juno on any of the axes was positive. Mm-hmm. But I have since learned that if you have Juno on the descendant, it basically means that you cling together when you're hit by something. And that could be support, or it could be um, that you only come together when you're fighting. Seen that one before, oh, too. It takes yeah, the that's, being that's very hit. Negative. Exactly. It takes the being hit and uh, uses that as the excuse for your coming together. But to answer your question, the fact that ours is trying the ascendant means that we, we're pretty independent in terms of the, you know, all that stuff in Aries. We basically do what we want. But when you think about this, the trying, this, it's uh, in your mind, giving your opinion. When you think about the relationship, then it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we are bonded. Yeah. So it's not, it's, not, uh, um, it's not an automatic wherever you go type thing. Yeah. It is a when you think about it type thing. Then it is triggered. Uh, Juno is very positive, though, when it's on the ascendant mm-hmm. or on the midheaven, how you're publicly seen. Um, the other two really heavy relationship asteroids are Uruguay, which I'll get to, and Bacchus. Bacchus is the asteroid of the friends who will never leave you. And ours is up here in Sagittarius 3. So uh, we already have some friends who will never leave us here. Yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> so uh, they're showing up with us. Um Sagittarius 3 means that we've got culture, and uh, coming from the Sagittarius culture, we pull it into Gemini, which is the third type energy, and we basically express our opinion of culture. Where we do that, uh, basically, we'll find different groups supporting the health of the relationship. Lastly, oh, and it's also on the midheaven. So it's going to be these friends, these folks who support us, are part of how we'll be known as a pair. Okay. The last one, which I just discovered about a month ago, is an asteroid called Uruguay. Now, Uruguay, let me see if I can kind of explain this because it's really, really important for a new relationship. Uruguay is essentially the, now that we're under contract, we need to perform type asteroid. And so if you are expressing your Uruguay, then basically what you're doing is you're, you're helping the relationship timer not start you're staying forever under the new contract so uruguay helps you keep the relationship new if uh so ours here is in capricorn eight one two three four five six seven eight and capricorn eight is typically associated with power so so it's in the realm of structure on other people dot scorpio we go from things like the news or business or those kind of laws and things like that and turn it into influence. So it helps the relationship influence things. Uh, So it's a good thing I'm a news junkie. It is. It's one of those rare times that completely pays off. You know what? And and actually for your, your information, anyone who's watching this, what prompted us to record this was actually a political conversation. So we weren't even uh, thinking about putting this video up there, but the, the influence of, um, you know, talking about politics and, you know, what's going on in the news. There was, a, unfortunately, another mass shooting today. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're um, as I said, we're, we're a bit of an activist pair, but in different ways. Right? Um, that helps our couple get galvanized towards projecting whatever influence it has to offer. And in this case, it turns it turns out to be a video. 
Um, now, I, I kind of want to finish off this recording by, by helping anybody watching this uh, learn how to intentionally set up their relationship for prosperity. So if somebody came to me and they say, okay, here's our relationship chart. Um, how do we make it like awesome? How do we as a pair make all kinds of money? How do we, you know, stay happy? Those kinds of things. Can we look at that from a re relative chart? Well, the answer is yes, right? The relative chart is basically, it's, it's almost its own entity. Uh, it's the merge of you and whoever you are interacting with. The first thing I want to know though is, uh, happiness in general for any kind of chart is typically found in the moon. Right. So Makes everyone's, sense. yeah, everyone's used to their sun sign. Your sun sign is how you approach people. Hey, my name is, and you've got the name <laughs> tag, but your reason for even showing up in that place, um, is, is, is rooted in your wants and where you want things, your moon is. So before you answer anything about the health of the relationship that you're in, you want to look at your relative charts moon. Ours, as you can see, is right here in Aquarius 5. Aquarius 5 is associated with dominance. Um, and the reason that is, is because it's Aquarius.leo. Aquarius is social information. It's kind of like being public. It's like being in a mall or whatever. Imagine a character who is in the mall. And actually, this same moon was in the, the recording that I just did on Independence Day. Mm -hmm. I think the United States chart also has its moon here. So Interesting. that bodes well for success as an American. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be successful in America and you happen to have a special planet that you use a lot in Aquarius 5, then the U.S. is going to favor your success because, frankly, uh, you've got an energy which is directly resonate with the mood of the country. And just so happens that both of our moons are there. So... That's kind of neat. That is neat. That is neat. So we've got uh, Aquarius 5 basically says you take that social information in Aquarius and you turn it into Leo character. So that's that guy who's in the mall and he's like, oh, mall, look at me. Wow, mall. You're right. He's, he's, oh. he's galvanized by like the information. And so he's like, he will pick up the microphone and he really will be there. Right. And so anyways, as long as we have that um, and we have it smooth, right, this is the thing with moons then it helps the relationship stay happy and healthy. A good way to hurt a relationship is for your moon to suck. So uh, if we wanted to sabotage our relationship, we would surround ourselves with either negative um, information that doesn't help us do something, right? Because obviously if you're, you're fighting the fight, then you know, negative information is kind of what you do. But negative information that you can't do anything about or... Um, information of the sort that you could not reflect your Leo character. So if we couldn't, if we heard something information <laughs> um, and we couldn't go out and use our Leo as a pair to address it. And we were frustrated as a couple in that kind of, kind of powerlessness, it would hurt our moon. So this is how you kind of look at your chart, um, see where the moon is and know that if you cannot do sign dot duo decanate, in a way that gives you proper release um, for that energy, then you know it's going to end up not kind of voting well for your exchange. That is curious. Yeah. So. So is there an example of that? Unfortunately, um, the United States chart itself, it's moving. right now. Lots of information. Mm -hmm. Lots of characters who feel frustrated. Sounds moon, right. Yeah, moon in Aquarius dot Leo feels negative. Everybody thinks it's negative. <laughs> like everybody everywhere, all over the world, right? So that's yeah, that's okay. The exception. So yeah. So a lot of you know the division and just general discontent that people were ignoring. And it yes. didn't go away. Yep. And now it's actually being talked about. Mm -hmm. But nobody's offering any solutions there. 
exactly. uh, show this deeply, deeply divided partisanship just continues and causes stagnation in policy and mm-hmm. everything else. Basically, as a result of what is essentially whining without offering <laughs> solutions. Something like okay. that. <laughs> gotcha. So, so there you go. When you have uh, the situation as as described, then yeah, it can it can make everybody feel pretty. You know, I don't know of a better of a better. Uh... I I actually think you nailed it right there. Okay, that, cool, that yeah. was very very clear on how people feel. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, oh, so this is interesting. Note how many times I've said we're kind of an activist pair, and now we're we're still talking about this. The asteroid of social justice palace is right on our moon. That, that. that makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And it's actually in the same duodecany. You notice that this is 1951 Aquarius and palace is 19 Aquarius. So, Interesting. yeah, the okay, more. That's pretty neat. It is. So, the more we're able to carry out at least some brand of social justice or to speak up. As a pair, mm-hmm. um, and we, the more we feel effective in doing so, the uh, kind of happier again the exchanges. Yeah. Um, now, I know that if you're watching this far, you're probably like, "Okay, we're so sick of y'all talking about yourselves." Um, well, hopefully, you got more um, out of this than just us talking about ourselves. It's more like this is what you look at for your relationship, because mm-hmm. obviously, I don't know who you are if you're even out there watching this. So I don't have your chart in front of me, and I obviously can't describe that. I think it was Ralph Waldo. And, no, it wasn't Emerson. I think it was Thoreau. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds more accurate. So, you know, I wouldn't talk about myself so much if there was anybody else in this room. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. was it Oscar? See, now I'm going to have to go look this up as uh, soon as we finish here, because I really yeah. like that quote. Yeah. I've used it pretty regularly. I like, uh, what should we call it's name? Chris something. I talk to myself because there is no one to talk to. <laughs> of course, you want to talk? Nope. <laughs> That's what he says in the song. Okay, so, yeah, we're going to have to do that. And it's, it's actually getting a little warm in here. So we're going to, or blazing hot, actually. So we're going to have to clear out. But before we do that, I do want to kind of show you how to um, kind of hack your relationship chart. On this chart, you'll notice that I have some extra asteroids. Sul, I call it Sulamitis because I like the fact that it sounds like a disease, but uh, some people might say it should be Sulamitis but, but, or Sulamitis. And unfortunately, I don't know the pronunci- proper pronunciation, so I will it, always it call it. It sounds a little bit maybe like a demon. I wouldn't say an illness oh. or a disease. <laughs> okay. Sulamitis. I feel like, you know, there, there's probably a little demon running around somewhere. Yeah. Sulamitis. Sulamitis, he's got that, that coughing, he's got, the, he's got all the symptoms. I picture him very hulking and red with like gray uh-huh. like arm, armor on the Oh, arms. Sulamitis, yeah. he's kind of like Juggernaut. It's, it's entirely possible I'm picturing a Transformer. <laughs> Or, yeah, a Marvel character. It could be a Marvel character. Yeah, exactly. It could go a lot of ways. Sulamitis is actually the asteroid of rising in the world. And cool. so um, we as a couple kind of want to be able to do something about the, uh, frankly, the, the pain that is out there that people are feeling. Uh, there are things that you do internal to your relationship that keeps you happy. But, but then from there, hopefully you can go out and kind of help the folks around you who are not as as uh, optimistic as you are. So in order to do that, we, you know, you kind of want to look at how to take your relationship and have it, you know, prosper in a certain kind of influence-based way. And one of the asteroids that you look at for that is Sulamites. Now ours is here, it says 658 Capricorn. That's Capricorn 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That is Capricorn dot Capricorn. It's the tenth sign leading to the tenth sub sign. So it's constant recycling Capricorn energy, and it's related to mastery. So if we wanted to rise in the world, we would basically have to do what the martial arts masters do, or an architect does, and basically build to build to build better. You make structures upon structures for more structures. 
and that's why it's associated with mastery. Is it a physical thing, though, always? Or Not necessarily. Because, I mean, like, processes mm -hmm. can also be built and built upon and, and things of that nature. So, mm -hmm. more the abstract. Yes, and in fact, it's mostly abstract because most of us aren't going to be architects. As long as you've got a boundary uh, for Capricorn 10, um, as long as you've got a boundary and you're putting boundaries on your boundaries, ordering things mm -hmm. uh, for other folks to, you know, the bigger bigger mass to deal with, then you're using your Capricorn tent. Uh, in fact, what we're doing here kind of does that in the sense that we're presenting a structure for reading a chart, a reading relationship chart. So to put structure on that structure, we're kind of, okay. kind of putting it out okay. there. Um, okay. Now, I don't have it displayed, but there's also the asteroid of uh, money-making, Brambilla. Mm -hmm. Ours happens to be on Bacchus. Remember the friends who never leave you? Mm -hmm. um, Capricorn, not Capricorn, Sagittarius 3. Basically, in order for us to have a certain kind of... Okay, Brambilla is not necessarily about money. It is about the resources you collect for reproducing your will. It can be money. Um, but if we wanted to help augment that, then we would interact with cultures and give our opinion on it. So the more we're able to go out there and say, here's what I think of this particular culture thing, cultural thing, basically the more we build up our brand below. Yeah. Okay. So if you're a couple and you're trying to figure out how to kind of help prosperity in your relationship, then you can look at things like Sulamitis for rising in the world, status-wise basically, or brand villa, for acquiring more resources for reproducing your will. I think that's about as much as I want to cover in here. Um, the idea, though, is that if we wanted to do some of these things on purpose and take our relationship chart and have the pair of us go forward in a particular way, we would look at our favorite asteroids and we would find where they are in uh, these signs and then the sub signs and actually um, uh, basically play those out with intentionality. That's actually the reason why we're both here on camera because um, if you want to build up your relative chart, your relationship chart, you really have to kind of do things as a pair. It's, it's not as simple as as a, here's my chart affecting her chart, or vice versa, right? It's how you're seen in public, it's how people talk about the two of you, those kinds of things, what you accomplish, what you come up together. So uh, yeah, that's an introduction to relationship chart reading um, with a particular emphasis on a couple of the prosperity asteroids. And uh, yeah, prosperity and commitment asteroids. Was there anything else that you wanted to kind of look at? I feel like a, a dog just kicked you um, in her sleep, and uh, that might mean they're getting restless. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, restless. She's uh, yeah, she's definitely uh, she's she's really relaxed. I mean, I know you can't see this. Yeah, but... she she is mm -hmm. laying on her back with her feet in the air, waving them around like she does not care. Uh, that's, that's what's yeah, so. Uh, yeah, we're going to attend to these folks right here. But uh, I would love to say if you have questions, please post them. Unfortunately, I'm just not like there <laughs> publicly. Everybody kind of knows this. So, um, but we may post some more videos kind of explaining how this works um, as the, the science of it starts to get more elaborate. You don't have questions? Like, no, I allow questions. Yeah. I just won't check the page or answer them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, okay. I'm uh, really... So people are asking questions of a boy. That's what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I just... Yeah. I, just, I, I don't like technology myself. I, I try to stay away from that stuff. Um, technology is fun. Yeah, no, I, I don't... Anyways, <laughs> so... Uh, but yeah, we may post more to kind of help people put their synastry together. I encourage you... Um, anybody watching this, that if you are in an exchange with somebody or, you know, 
your job or the country or the business or whatever, and you run the relative chart, that is you merge your birth times and birthplaces into one, I encourage you to think about the relationship as a whole. It's not just a matter of, of individual dynamics. When you build things together, you, I mean, this chart is, is going to kind of tell you how it goes. There are other things that you can do with a relative chart. You can look at not so much how long it's going to last, but you can look at major milestones in it. Um, you can, you can uh, look for pitfalls. Uh, I do need to add, by the way, because I've seen this and it's, it'll, it'll help people. If you have a negative asteroid um, in a key place, it is so important that you get the opportunity to, maybe if you have to tiptoe around it, but get the opportunity to talk to the person about what you plan to do um, in exchange with them in order to kind of mitigate what you saw. You don't ever have to really tell them what you saw, but you really want to talk that out. There was a person who I knew, and it's not Shan, it's not you, but there was a person who I knew with whom my relative chart had one of the worst asteroids possible um, at the Imam Coli. And the Imam Coli, by the way, um, before I forget, is one of the strongest locations in your chart um, because it's the behind the scenes, it's the everyday of what you do. We had the asteroid Liberatrix, which is basically a relationship killer. Um, I want to be free. See ya. I don't exist anymore. Right? We had that as our every day on the Imam Coli. And you that's, can... That sounds terrible. It is terrible. And you can guess actually what happened to that relationship. It ended. Of course. <laughs> right? But, but in hindsight, if I had been able to talk to that person and say, hey, let's just meet every now and then. We'll, we'll come back every couple of months or whatever, then we probably could have survived because we would have made the sudden approach and the sudden departure commonplace. Um, sometimes it happens that you get a really bad asteroid um, somewhere. Natalie, Janina, Liberatrix, Ricarda, Hamiltonia. Um, uh, Murray's not particularly positive. Prisca is sometimes negative. I'm just naming some of the ones that come to mind. If you see any of these and they're on your Imam Coli or your descendant or your midheaven, or if you have an exchange with somebody and it's chronically bad and you just want to understand it by running your relative chart with them, then, you know, it helps to, to, to kind of know what you're looking at and then make plans either with them or at least within yourself in order to address it. You can check out my book, Alma Mater, because there is a really good chapter on the negative aspects and what to do with them. Alma Mater was written in the middle of uh, it's a big spiritual transition for me. And so there are some sections of that book which are quite negative. But, um, you know, things have calmed down since the writing of that book. However, if you find yourself kind of in the middle of that bridge, those negative chapters are valuable to study because I mean, not everything is, is, you know, cotton candy, right? And not everything is easy. So um, be sure to check those sections out, especially as they, they uh, relate to relative charts. And I wish everybody luck in uh, building good and prosperous relationships. There you go. Mm -hmm.